The Great War. The war that forged Canada as a nation. The war to end all wars. These are some of the ways that history refers to the First World War, taking place from 1914 to 1918. As Europe was torn apart by trenches and artillery, Canada was more removed from the action overseas. However, there was a different kind of war happening on the home front. Fear and racism was fostered by the state through use of aggressive propaganda and perpetuation of negative stereotypes. This xenophobia was manifested in internment camps, where Canada sent their prisoners of war and enemy aliens. Enemy aliens were any person that lived in Canada, naturalized or immigrated, that belonged to a nationality that was fighting against Canada in the war. Suspicion of secret spies and guerrilla fighters in their neighborhood turned average Canadians into monsters. One of the reasons that uh, the enemy aliens were interned is there had been a scare, uh, much like in our own times, a scare about terrorism. And there's a huge literature about uh, secret agents, uh, deep moles as they would call them today, uh, raising chaos in the society. And this was certainly very, very prevalent uh, in, in, in Canada. These civilians were treated the same as captured military personnel. German and Ukrainian citizens were faced with the reality that their own communities were turning against them in a time of hysteria. The story of how the, the civilian internees were taken into custody is, is a very tragic and awful one. And the government, uh, as really was the laissez-faire ethic of the time, left it to citizens virtually. Uh, these local people who had no particular, they had no great specialist qualifications, and the system was essentially left to them. The discrepancies between policy and practice are extensive. There was a lack of manpower to oversee and guard the camps. Another problem was the fact that before this, such a thing as an enemy alien was not a legitimate class of people. Prisoners of war were one thing, and their treatment was specifically regulated through the International Hague Convention. There was no convention for mere citizens imprisoned on a suspicion. This led to the treatment of these civilians to vary greatly and allowed for abuses. Responses varied tremendously from camp to camp, and it appears that in the better organized camps, the Commandant would actually insist that everybody look out for the welfare of the prisoners. There were instances that General Otter had to investigate of using physical violence, even torture. Despite the brutality of being turned in by your own peers and the unjust treatment they faced in the camps, the aliens did not simply accept this oppression. Uh, from everything that I've read, dissent is more um, passive uh, measures, uh, refusal to work, uh, work slowly, work without enthusiasm, follow the regulations very, very reluctantly. This was met with food rations being taken away, humiliation or physical violence. Tensions were high between the civilians who were living miserable lives and the personnel that thought this job would be easy. While this largely broke the spirit of the internees, another factor was introduced that revitalized the nature of dissent in the camps. It would seem that the civilians became more militant uh, when uh, they came into contact uh, with uh, particularly the, the, the German uh, people who had been interned, both civilians who had military experience and some of the German uh, military personnel. And it was, the Germans inspired them to take more effective action and be, to be better organized. Of the 8,579 people interned, only approximately 800 were actual prisoners of war captured in combat circumstances. They were put in the same camps because of lack of resources to create distinct camps. The other reason was that, according to policy, there was no difference between military personnel and the townspeople taken from rural Canada. Our very first regulation in October of 1914 talks about internees and prisoners of war interchangeably. So right from the very beginning, our Justice Department did not make that distinction. Because of this, untrained and non-threatening civilians were put in the same spaces as military personnel from the opposing countries. These people were more rebellious and united than the civilians were in their rejection of Canadian authority. While the enemy aliens would mostly resist by striking and small acts of rebellion, the German military captives were trained for such imprisonment. Of course, uh, the 800 that are brought in um, from um, Newfoundland and um, the West Indies are merchant mariners, but also naval seamen who actually <laughs> had some military experience. So you do see organized escape attempts and organized protests among the, the German groups. Some camps faced the influence of rebellion more than others. These were the camps in the Maritimes, where the majority of German Navy prisoners were captured and imprisoned. 
Uh, one of the most famous, of course, being uh, uh, a large breakout attempt at the Amherst camp in Nova Scotia, uh, which resulted in some considerable violence and shooting and uh, one guard badly injured and, and one of the escapees. Uh, this camp was specifically open when the capture of German men caused the nearby camp in Halifax to be overcrowded. It came to be the biggest camp in Canada with more than 800 internees housed at one time. One of the prisoners, Leon Trotsky, was held there and after being released wrote a book on his experiences titled, My Life. This book gives insight to the culture of dissent in the camps. The whole month I was there was like one continuous mass meeting. I told the prisoners about the Russian Revolution, about Leibniz, about Lenin, and about the causes of the collapse of the old international, and the intervention of the United States in the war. Besides these speeches, we had constant group discussions. Our friendship grew warmer every day. The officers ended by complaining to the camp commander, Colonel Morris, about my anti-patriotic propaganda. This did not happen until the last few days of our stay at the camp, and served only to cement my friendship with the sailors and workers who responded to the colonel's orders by a written protest bearing 530 signatures. This was undoubtedly a dark time in Canadian history, and one that is often forgotten or overlooked. However, it is these stories of the people who refuse to sit back and be oppressed that can be instrumental moving forward. They tell us that overreacting and relying on xenophobic stereotypes will actually lead to more dissent and protest than trusting the citizens that have only been loyal to their country.